Welcome to this week's episode of Fellowship in Essential Oils. This week, we're looking at Laurel. Well, I think we're looking at Laurel. We've got to work out what we're going to be talking about today, Liz, because sometimes Laurel gets a bit confusing when we're talking about essential oils. Well, yeah, I agree. It, I, I spend a lot of time pondering this and thinking, are oh, they talking about the same oil as me? So, uh, Laurus nobilis uh, is, is Laurel, but Laurel is a... A ma- well, Laureche uh, family is enormous. It's like 200, uh, get the number right, two and a half thousand to three and a half thousand known species in in there. So in particular, I always thought, and I just said to, to the strong silent one, bring me some laurel out the garden. He went, I dug it up. <laughs> but uh, but in, in, in Britain, laurel is... Uh, a plant with beautiful, big, bright green, g- glossy leaves. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that laurel essential oil comes from the bay tree. Mm. Bay which you would which you would cook with and and sometimes put in, you know, to flavour different dishes, wouldn't you? Correct, correct, yes. And it, yeah. and it is um very much a herbal medicine. You see it a lot in uh, medieval. Um, stuff by Culpepper and Gerard. It was a very strongly used herbal medicine, but it's one of those that you're kind of mm, not quite sure all the time. So certainly that's the one that I work with that is the bay tree. Likewise. So if you're looking, if you've got a bottle at home, and you're like, are they talking about what I'm what I'm looking at? Look at that Latin name. It always comes back to the Latin names. And it's Loris nobilis is the one that we're going to be talking about today. And we're going to call it Laurel because you can't stop us. That's so right. let's have a look at how would you be using this one physically? I find, you know, it's um, it's a respiratory oil for me, really. Um, and interestingly, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I used to work in the, the business with my mom, so we're going right back to, to the maybe late 80s, early 90s, I was given a bottle of uh, uh laurel oil nobody had written anything about it at all and said right what do you pick up from that and straight away that's exactly what I said respiratory uh and also I said removes petrochemicals and I've never seen anybody say that again uh, since but I always use it for that so if somebody has um like I used to live on the the uh junction 10 of the m6 which is probably the second busiest and most polluted place in in the uk And it's no wonder that I got bad lungs. Um, And so that is something that I um, talk about to people who have like asthma, COPD, that kind of thing, that there is like a buildup of chronic pollution and and Laurel's very good for that. Um, But also, um, well, I'll I'll talk more about that in a minute, but also um, a digestive, obviously. Um, but also things like um, period pains, because it's very high in 1-8 cineol, which is um, why it's very good for respiratory things. So it's made up of almost half of 1-8 cineol. Um, so it has that fantastic F, uh, uh, way of opening up the, the lungs, but also that is very good for pain receptors too, so it, as an antinociceptic. Um, Culpepper, when he's talking about bay leaves, so obviously that's confusing, but that is what we're talking about, um, talks about how uh, you shouldn't use it in pregnancy lest it procure an abortion. And uh, I, I, I agree with that. It's, uh, it's one of those oils that I would like quite often. There's no safety data that says don't use it uh, in pregnancy. But to me, that it has that kind of energy of like going, get out um so I, that's one that i would avoid using but very good for gynae problems he also calls them diseases of the mother which uh means <laughs> menopause <laughs> so, <laughs> so i would clarify that and also i would have never did... actually have guessed that actually so i'm glad yeah. you did i would have just nodded politely so rude, isn't it? diseases of the mother <laughs> but yeah menopause uh and it does have like that cooling nature so for hot flushes as well as um you know the the pains mood screens that kind of stuff 
Um, he also talks about how if you steep a bay leaf in wine, it's very good for scorpion skin that stings. So perhaps that's not something in the UK we would have to be worried about. There's other parts of the world where scorpion stings are an issue, then laurel oil may be useful then. But um, outside of breathing, which is the main reason that I use it, I also use it for uh, oracular purposes, which we will talk about later. Um, so tell me about your your use of it. Do you use it much? Not a lot. Um, I, I guess for me, and this is kind of a question I was like, oh, I want to talk about this today with you. 1-H-Cineol or eucalyptol is its main constituent, as you've already mentioned. Obviously, eucalyptus is kind of the superstar of the 1-H-Cineol oils. Are there any times I basically will just alternate or switch between the two interchangeably? Is there any time when you personally would go, oh, no, this is a eucalyptus time and this is a laurel time? You did mention the petrochemical, um, you know, and the pollution aspect of it. A any others that separate the two or would you just go either either? That's a really good question. I do wish you'd primed me before. <laughs> <laughs> I have to take 10 minutes. I don't think it's as decongestant as eucalyptus. Okay. Yeah. So if you like, well, I haven't done the experiment now, really, I should sit and do this. But my feeling is if I had a blocked up nose and I inhaled eucalyptus, I would have a better effect than if I inhaled laurel. But I'm only mm. just going that off the top of my head. Um Likewise, if I had a really chesty cough, I think I would. You, I would always. Yeah, personally, Laurel would be my backup plan. Yeah, I'm wondering. This is only speculation. We have no evidence behind this, but maybe if there is congestion or phlegm, that's a eucalyptus. If it's more pollution or irritate, irritant, you seem to have had good success with Laurel. Maybe Laurel would be better in that instance. And actually, when I think about it, now you've now you've pressed me. The times when I have had most success with laurel have been with chronic problems with breathing rather than acute problems. And by that, mm -hmm. I mean somebody has had a cough for a long time, has asthma, has COPD, that kind of issue, rather than they've got a chest infection. But that might also be because I have not, used it i've just gone for the eucalyptus so you've you, yeah so you've revealed my own plan to myself which i hadn't even noticed yeah there we go well another thing that i'm always a big fan of is obviously um when we can it's from a more holistic or an energetic point of view it's great to work with plants that are from our native land wherever we reside type of thing and i'm obviously a big ambassador for australian native essential oils um in other ways if i can find an australian native that does something similar to a northern Hemisphere oil, I'll opt for that. Really, eucalyptus, is, they're the domain of the Southern Hemisphere. So if you can get laurel and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, especially in the European area, maybe that's going to be a better choice just for working with the energy of your own land. I think that's, I think that's an extremely valid point. Um, just going off that, because I did think of something and I forgot to say it. We were talking about toxicity, and, and Cole Pepper says specifically for toxicity, but he talks about it in a different way. He talks about how he would use bay leaves to make somebody sick as an emet uh, emetic. So if they'd had some kind of poison or if they'd got some kind of bad stomach and he thought, no, that's something's going on inside, he would use it to make them sick. Uh, and I do think, and, and this kind of relates to the oracular stuff, which we'll, I'll talk about after. But there is this this feeling of bleh, blurting, mm -hmm. you know, moving. So it shifts it out. So you do have like, if, if somebody's, somebody might have like COPD or asthma and it not be chesty, for example. Um, Laurel will often bring about what I term a healing crisis. And that can mean many different things in many different in, in environments. But in this kind of situation, it's suddenly like they start having a productive cough that is full of crap. You know, that uh, all of the horrible stuff is coming off their lungs as they're coughing it up and they didn't even know it was there. Um, you wouldn't get that with eucalyptus. You would with, with, with laurel. 
Mm. So maybe, you know, we're going to kind of go into in a little while a bit of the aspects of how it's associated with, I guess, illumination might be a bit of a kind of introductory word to the theme we're going to cover a little bit. Um, so when you need to purge some darkness or purge some pollutants on whatever level that may be, maybe that's the time to reach for your laurel rather than your eucalyptus. Yeah, so um, it was a really important plant in the ancient world. Um, so the um, the Romans called it the plant of the good angels. So that mm. is, is high praise indeed, but also... I don't know if you have them in Australia, but do you have poet laureates? I've heard the term. Okay, so uh, the poet no. laureate is like an award that happens each year, and it's a, a given to the uh, the finest of the poet. And it's because in old days, the laureate would wear a laurel crown. But also in France, they have the, the exams that they take to finish work. He's called the baccalaureate. That means laurel berry. So the best, uh, so that's the the classification of their most important um, uh, exam. And so this idea of um, of achievement, victory, uh, but very much like Myrtle, very similar. Really, I, I should really have not have done the the um, the two oils so close together, perhaps. So where Myrtle is victory without bloodshed the uh, laurel is intellectual um, victory and so it's not so much about um intuition it's about hearing a different part of your brain speak the the, the uh, left is it right hand left hand brain is the oh i don't know the creative side uh the the less logical side is to do with um with to do with laurel and my son, my son Andy said, "How many tenses are there in the English language?" I said, "Oh God, I don't know." And he said, "So, past, present, and future." I went, "Yeah, but there's others." And he went, "What about pa prophetic, perfect?" And I was like, "What on earth is that?" And he said, "That is the language of the prophets, and it's how they spoke." in a way that it had already happened because God would intervene. And so it they'd spoke as if it had, if it had already happened. So um, I said also a bit like Veni Vidi Vici, we came, we saw, we conquered, but it was said in the, like later after. It That's exactly right. Yes, exactly right. And Laurel is very much like that. So if somebody has like a, a nervous disposition about doing a, a presentation, an exam, um, particularly sort of uh, defending their thesis, that kind of thing, where it's, it is logical, but also it's, it's like you speaking, not just other um, people. That's a laurel indication that you feel like you have already succeeded. You have already you're already on the other side of it. Uh, and that is perhaps why the oracles used it, because they, they could see the future as if it was the past. Mm, yeah. And I guess to kind of before we go too much further, I guess we should look a little bit about the origin story of Laurel. Now, probably one of the common ones that is, is that there was, I think it was a nymph. Was she a nymph, Daphne? Daphne was a nymph, yep. yeah. That um, basically, now what, I'm trying to recall it now, so many nymph love stories. Was she interested in Apollo or not interested in Apollo? Depends. Not, not interested because she was a chaste. So she, so a nymph can I can be many different things. So with my bee priestess head on, a nymph is either uh, a, a goddess, uh, a priestess, a beautiful girl, or an unhatched bee. So all of those things are neat. Nymphs. In the case of um, Daphne, she was she was a, a chaste priestess. Um, and Apollo had desires upon her, and she very kindly tried to turn him down, uh, but he wasn't having any of it. Are you able to pick it up from there? Uh, I believe then basically it was her father um, in, in the version I've read who's, who's like, well, the only way to protect you is to turn you into the Daphne tree or turn you into the laurel tree, um, and thus he would wear Apollo in, as re reverence or in, in remembrance of her became renowned as wearing the laurel um, crown. But I can see, uh, see in your eyes that there's extra to add to that that you've got. 
No, only the, the, the other versions. So I agree. That that was the one that I learned that it was her father. But the more interesting one is that Gaia took offence to the way that, uh, that um, Apollo was was uh, carrying on. And potentially uh, this is maybe pre-patriarchy, perhaps an earlier version, if you like. So she turned her into a tree. Uh, and the outrageous thing was that, that um, Apollo, even though she'd gone to extreme lengths to turn herself from one, to shape-shifted from one state to another, he still embraced her, uh, mm. which was... He still put his arms around her, and he would not be told. Uh, and and yeah, that so the there's like the idea that when he wore the laurel crown, he was victory over her. You know, he still got his own way. So you've got like two versions. You've got like the romantic version, but also there's like an insidious, uh, mm. almost like Me Too thing going on here of like bloody men. They won't be told sometimes, you know, and, and that, that myth is definitely one of those stories. Yeah. And probably in modern day symbology, we've all seen the laurel crown, you know, that kind of U-shaped or horseshoe-shaped, you know, crown of laurel we associate it with the Olympics with and basically with overall victory. Um, and, of course, the Olympics wasn't exactly the spectacle we see today. It wasn't just about sports. It was about intellectual pursuits and a whole range of things, wasn't it? Yes, exactly right. Um, so, and, and also it wasn't the only games. So the the Olympic Games was just one of many. So, for example, we'll, we're talking about the oracles, and I'll, and I'll explain why I keep mentioning this. Um, the, uh, at, at Delphi, uh, at Delphi, they had their own games, which were were the de uh, the, um, the the Delphic games, the Pythian games, and they were there would be like a day of sports, a day of music, a day of oration. There would be um, a, a, there was a, a, um, debating, so it was the best of the best, um, and those and that was and these were all like in offerings to please the deity. So uh, 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 Adelphi was to to, um, to please Apollo. Um, and so, yeah, you would often, in all of those kind of games, you'll see the, the victor wears, wears laurel. Exactly right, yeah. Mm. I, I'm just thinking back to, I, I'm like, those Olympics would be fascinating. Can we bring them back with debating and all those different things? That would be a... Well, I, so actually, so that's why... I, I, Pause then, because I thought I was going to say something else, and then I thought, well, what was I going to say? So did you know that the modern-day Olympics uh, originated from near where I live in Ludlow? They they started yeah. in Much Much Wenlock. So when we go to the hospital, we have to drive through Much Wenlock, and there's very little there, except for a sign that says the, the birthplace of the modern Olympics. And it was a teacher who decided to resurrect them again, uh, as like a um, a school thing, and then it became a, a worldwide phenomenon. But yeah, he, he only resurrected the sports side. Amazing. Now, moving on to more of an emotional healing aspect that I really like um, to use Laurel for is around that theme of victory. And we find so many people in the world don't feel comfortable winning or shining their light. You know, Apollo is that radiant being, and a lot of us will dim our light um, very much so. Um, sometimes things happen to us as children where, you know, there may you may be told, well, don't show off, or, you know, maybe one of your siblings wasn't as good as you, or sometimes we have a sibling that maybe has a disability or an injury, and it's like, stop, you know, stop asking for attention or stop trying to shine, and we're encouraged to dull our shine in different ways. And so, you know, you were talking before about um, victory of the intellectual kind and when we need to show our intelligence and different things like that. Anyone who struggles with that, struggles to shine their light, I think Laurel is absolutely amazing uh, in that way for children. Um, but also as we get into adulthood, if you don't feel like shining bright, in places like Australia, um, we have something called the tall poppy syndrome, where no one likes someone who grows, thinks that they're better and grows above. And so this, is, this can be good for a sense of equality that no one shows off and thinks they're better than anyone else, but it can also kind of hold people back because you don't want to kind of take your little moment to shine and we all should have, a you know, a different time to shine. So wherever you find yourself in a case where you're like holding yourself back, hiding your light from the world and not giving your best um, and not comfortable with that, 
Laurel's a really nice one to work through and go, well, why? Why do I not feel like stepping forward, saying what I have to say, sharing my my skills, whatever they may be? I find it really great just to breathe, let go of that heaviness. We talked about getting rid of that density before on the physical level, and then off you go. It's a really great one in that way. I'm trying to think how to phrase my reply because I think I, I absolutely agree with all of that. Um. And I, I've kept referring to the oracles all the way through, so I'm going to, I'm going to delve into that now. So perhaps the most important um, use of the, the laurel tree was at Delphi. So the oracle of Delphi was one of the most important um, decision makers, if you like, decision influence. We call them influencers today, okay? Uh, influencers is a really good way to describe um, them in the ancient world and people came right across um, the um, European continent to the Mediterranean to consult with the Oracle. Um, and they would work in shifts. So there would be three Oracles working at any given time. And we talk about the Oracle of Delphi, but this lasted for 1800 years. So it's not just one, it's many, as I say, working in shifts. And the interesting thing, that made me uh, stop was these women were um, very important for many different ways in that they would um, help to consult with um, if somebody, if, if like it was a leader or a tribal leader who wanted to know where to make his settling, for example, he would consult the Oracle. So they would come to the, to, to Delphi. They would queue for a very, very long time because they only worked on uh specific days throughout the year I think it was nine if I remember rightly um and you would have to wait for a very long time the, when you did finally get to see the oracle she would have started her shift by going down to the Castilian spring doing a, a purification ritual she would come up she would sit on her tripod and she would shake her laurel to indicate to Apollo that she was ready for him to speak um, and again, we have this idea that um, the the uh, the oracular site at Delphi is much much older than Apollo. So the story tells it's again it's another Gaia story. Gaia's daughter Delphine was a serpent dragon who who delivered the um, the oracles, and Apollo usurped her and took over, and it was him that would speak. And his oracles would be uh, sent up via Numa. So Numa can be seen in many different ways. So particularly, we say that it is the breath, um, and it and so it's kind of a bit like how we would imagine chi today. So it was like the breath and the energy that moves through the body, and the oracle knew how to move this. Uh, um, this breath in a certain way so that she would bring up Apollo's words through her lower mouth. So you can work that out for yourself through her lower mouth, up through her womb, and they would be blurted out of her mouth in hexameter verse. So that means that everything rhymed and there was 12 beats and it was kind of riddling. So there was like a sign over the top that said, know thyself. Um, and another one in, a, in another doorway that said uh, everything in moderation. But know thyself was very important because she would give you the way in, in this riddling way. And it was down to you to make decisions based on that. So this idea of there is a, like a, a logical point, but your own intellect, your own intuition uh, deals with it. We also have the idea of the pneuma. So I talked about how it being it its breath but also Numa we also know now was ethylene so she was sitting over a crack in the earth and there was volcanic uh, smoke fumes coming up which potentially made her high we hear that she was high whether she was or not we don't know but that's what we're told uh, and she would have this this prophecy so but also laurel kind of sometimes makes you feel a bit out of your head if you breathe it enough don't let me not talk about safety afterwards um so that that's an indication as well how she was able to 
and it, and the, it almost like breathing like the dragon did you know she breathes out the smoke and the words and and, and remember I said it was like a, a blurting thing but when you were talking about the tall poppy syndrome that's a really important like aspect that happened to the um, priestesses so incidentally they were melissa's and they were so melissa delphis was the oracle of delphi the delphic v um and originally they were young women beautiful virgins whatever virgin meant in those days didn't mean the same as it did now they were chaste but but they were young um but because they had a way of often challenging the patriarchy even then uh, and standing up to them. On one occasion, one of the women was profoundly raped to put her in her place. Uh, and then the whole system changed and it became the job of the crone. So young women were taken out, uh, women of like 50, around about that age, whose husbands had died so they were widows, so they didn't have any need to have sex anymore. So they were still chaste, uh, served, but they still wore the maiden's garb. Um, and you'll have a lot, there's lots of instances in the evidence where people have come and challenged the, um, the priestess and particularly tried to get them to do an oracle on a day when she wasn't supposed to do an oracle. So the planets weren't right and the situation wasn't right and she's refused. And they've tried to force her and she stood up for herself. So this idea of breathing and being able to speak one's truth calmly and with like, you're not going to do that to me. That's that's very much a laurel thing. And bear, and bear in mind, you know, that that kind of debating aspect that I talked about with the, you know, the the, the crown and the um, member Apollo is he is the sun but he's also the god of music the god of poetry the god of logic all of those things that kind of like super tongue of able to just been able to get out that's a um a laurel thing there's one lovely story where one don't remember the leader anyway he had said to the oracle you will give me an oracle you will sit on the the uh the tripod as you are instructed and so she does, and she says, "I predict you will do whatever you whatever you please." And he think, goes away thinking that he has got his own way, but actually it comes back on him, and his um, his tribe is beaten two years later because people have taken umbrage to what he did to the to the priestess to to the oracle, and they overpower him. Um, so this idea of being able to know what to say at the right moment and being able to, to argue your way out of people who are bullying you it, it is a laurel thing. It's definitely an intellectual victory oil, as you mentioned before, isn't it? That's a real strong point of it. I kind of think it's still not a, you know, it's definitely more sacred to something like Apollo than it would be probably to Mars, which is more that victory with bloodshed. And a and, and laurel speaks beautifully you know mm. she it, 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 when she stand when she stands up for herself you don't swear at people that's not what you're saying you are absolutely cutting their legs out with the clever answer that they're like you know <laughs> it's very much so and i'm gonna go off on a slight tangent just for a bit of crystal reference um it is believed that people would actually take a sapphire um to the oracle delphi because it would be said in riddles and there are many different crystals that are really great for the third eye chakra, those dark blue or indigo crystals. Many will actually help with the intuition, but sapphire helps you not only to receive messages, but to interpret them as well. And that's why it's a stone of the nobility. So if you are working with Laurel and you want to bring in a sapphire, that would be an interesting pairing to work with. Never heard of that. Thank you. That's really interesting. Yeah. Another aspect of Laurel that kind of ties on from this victorious point of view view that I wanted to share today is the exploration of what's called the bright shadow. So we all know our shadow self, and that's something that's explored quite in depth. It's those aspects of ourselves that we don't like, that we hate about ourselves maybe, and that we keep hidden away. And once we can actually learn to love them, there actually can be some self-growth of that. But then there's the bright shadow. 
and I'm going to kind of lead you in a back way around to understand this. And I want you just to think in your own mind as I'm talking about someone you admire. Now, that may be someone in your life or it may be someone famous. And as I'm talking, I want you to think of, well, what are some characteristics of that person that we you admire? Maybe, you know, you admire their courage, you admire their intellect, you admire their, their, their grace with words, their kindness, whatever it may be. And then if you write those things down and then you reflect on them, you may need someone else to look at these words as well. But what you'll often find is what you respect in other people, you actually have within yourself. And I did this activity with a group of tarot readers, a beautiful group of tarot readers from the Western Australian Tarot Guild last weekend. And they did that. And what they all found is they were basically, they wrote down some words, they shared it with a partner and they're like, yeah, that's you. Often we can't, we, we avoid the, the darkness or the, the yucky parts of ourselves, but we also can't see our own light, our own brightness. And sometimes we have to see it in other people and think about what do I admire in other people? Do I admire courage? Do I admire grace? Do I admire kindness? And we often resonate and like things in other people that actually exist within us as well. And I find Laurel's a really good one because it is about victory and shining your light or actually doing that work and going, oh, okay, I am what I admire in other people. That's absolutely brilliant. And actually I, I use the opposite of that and I hadn't even thought of, of turning on its head with that. So quite often if I'm working with somebody who can't move on from being angry with somebody and they're very riled by that person what you'll find is what that is annoying them is actually something they know about themselves that they don't like so mm. what they're seeing is the darkness in their soul um yeah. and so that that's like a big that's a big part of doing high priestess work that you start to learn to work with your shadow so exactly the same thing um and what I, and this is particularly pertinent, I guess, for people who are like in a domestic violence situation or or the bullying situation again, really, that you can't do anything to change somebody else's actions. You can't. The only thing that you have control over is your own response to situations. Mm. And so working on that, well, what is it that I'm seeing in them that's riling them up so much? Why is that triggering me so much? What is going on with my psyche that's really winding me up like that? What am I feeling guilty about? Or what about what, you know, and working with that. And so it, it, that mirroring is um, is a powerful tool. And, and yet uh, Laurel would be fantastic from that because not only are you you're like addressing the emotions, but you're addressing them from an intellectual point of view. Very much so. And I guess we, we can also go, and add on to that, that Laurel being a respiratory oil, when we when we come back to our breath, we come back to ourselves and we reflect on ourselves, it's amazing how many people are, you know, blaming the world for the way their life is rather than coming back to looking within. And I guess Laurel would help in that way as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, although I would say yes, but I think there are other oils that would work better on the victimisation aspect of it. Yeah. because I think maybe that's a big jump. Do you know what I mean? You've kind yeah, of got to get you. past that bit. Too. But but yes, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah. What what oils would you go with with that victimisation? For that that kind of knowing oneself Why really deeply, I... I, I find Copa Eber to be really helpful. Why do I do that to myself? Because I know as soon as I do it, you go, oh, and I go, oh, I don't know. Um, spite, I use tangerine. Oh. Huh um victimization mm, it's not quite the same it's not quite the same thing i'd have to sit and reflect on it but the idea of like almost like hypochondria do you know what i mean everything happens to me palmarosa interesting yeah um maybe some basil Mm -hmm. I'd have to think on the on the different situations, but yeah, I I think I would therapeutically I would try and deal with that. I think the jump from you need to like you need to look from outside yourself to looking deep inside yourself is a yeah. long jump, 
and do it in stages. Yeah. And I guess it's hard me putting you in a theoretical position. I'm sure you're like me is when you're working with someone or working with yourself, intuitively oils will jump in and go, this is the right one for the right person. And we'll, and we'll start to map trends over time that that keeps coming up for that situation. Would I be right in saying that for you? Absolutely bang on. Yeah. 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 So a- anything else that you would use floral for on the kind of holistic levels or is it mainly that kind of intellectual victory and feeling comfortable with victory and shining our light? Would, would you kind of tie it up in that little yellow bow? I work on both. <laughs> yes, yes, except that I think that there's also like a whole set of people with breathing problems who struggle to express themselves mm-hmm. and do not speak their truth. And yeah. so yeah. then there's like that cross section that would be like, oh, I know. <laughs> you know that I'd go there, but but I probably wouldn't go outside of breathing uh, and digestion physically that much. Yeah. Now, before we dance around our chakras and our astrology, you said to remind you about safety. Safety. So safety is a really complicated one with uh, with Laurel, uh, with many disagreements and many thoughts about it, and much debate around it. Interestingly, which I thought was quite amusing when I did it. So. Uh, I do some work for um, for a company doing their IFRA certificates. So anybody who doesn't know what an IFRA certificate is, it's um, a European um, requirement. Um, IFRA means International Fragrance Regulation Authority, and what they do is they break an essential down uh, essential oil down into constituents and then give you a maximum dilution for that particular constituent based on its likelihood to be a skin irritant other things as well usually but usually a skin irritant and particularly this is the so if you like formulating um anything really that's got like a fragrance in it so whether that would be like skincare products perfume but also like lip um lip balms candles all of those things get affected so Laurel has a few uh, strange requirements because it has levels of eugenol and methyl eugenol, which have been amended in October 23. There was a 51st Amendment of the of IFRA. So they, um, around methyl eugenol, they do change. IFRA says maximum dilution of uh, laurel should be 0.1 sorry no 0.01 wait no 0.1 0.1% Tisserand and Young say 0.5% the EU regulations say 0.005% mm. so whatever is small and it just yeah. makes me laugh that it was like, well, you've got to work your own intuition around it. You've got to think it out, work out how you feel about it. That's absolutely an oracular thing. Um, personally, I go 0.5%. I agree with Tisserand and Young. Um, but yeah, there aren't set guidelines. What's important, though, is I would say not in pregnancy. Um, because it's high in 1A cineol, it's not, a, not an oil for children. Um, it's an oil for for over sixties, really, but adults. Um, and think how if you were going to go children, why would you? We've talked about how uh, you know there's other oils that can work uh, work perfectly well, but how minute you'd have to go for children is just not worth the effort, to be honest with you. Um, so yeah, it's quite a difficult oil to know your way around. But I personally would go 0.5 percent, not use it in pregnancy, not use it on children. I was just reflecting on the 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 one eight Sydney oil that we were covering before, and you know eucalyptus being a southern hemisphere plant, and that's the main source there. The only other kind of superstar in the one eight Sydney oils that I kind of know well is Ravensara, which again is really a Madagascar, a southern hemisphere. Is there anything else that would be native to that? You know, northern Africa, Europe, Asia kind of um, arena that would have a decent amount amount of one eight Sydney oil. 
you should have asked me that before I came on camera. Um, I've got all the news not... today. I'm, I'm challenging does... you intellectually. I know. <laughs> and all and in the it's, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Is it? I, I would have thought that there was a, an amount in Myrtle, but without checking, I don't know. No. Um uh, but, I mean, the other thing is, we do have eucalyptuses here. They're not native, but we do no. have them, and they grow extensively now, so we do have them. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it does seem like an Australian molecule to me. Actually, I had just thought of one. It's a bit of a kind of a, 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 a rare one, but Litsia or Mei Chang, not the berry where we normally get the oil from that has that beautiful lemon scent, but I've actually recently got my hands on some Mei Chang or Litsia flower. And that has a real eucalyptus aroma and is high in 1,8-cineol. And I, what kind of blew my mind is normally 1,8-cineol is in leaves. And this was a, a blossom, a flower that actually had it in there, which was quite spectacular. Where does it grow? China. Interesting, isn't it? It's like, it's like the, the planet's changing things as we go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I find this in the crystal world as well. Crystals and oils seem to come to the fore at the right time in this world. And I know even your mother um, in her book, Garden of Eden, um, there's a few oils in there that she's like, this oil is percolating until later, not one to work with just yet, but will be relevant. Yeah, so do, I didn't read what she wrote about uh, um, Laurel, did you? No, not not specifically on that one. But, yeah, I just no, you, remember you, reading. You are, you are quite right. They They go to sleep, definitely. They definitely yeah. go to sleep, and they and then suddenly they have surges. And I definitely walked into Melissa as she was growing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So let's talk about chakras. We've talked a lot about the respiratory system and being, you know, speaking with the intellect and winning with your words. Are you placing it on the throat chakra, or are you placing it elsewhere? No, I'm going to say heart chakra, lungs, not throat. Heart chakra. Speak from the heart. Um, mm -hmm. but also, I'm going to say sacral chakra as well. Um, mm, this is in com completely stream of consciousness. I hadn't thought this out at all, but so the idea that the oracle brings the pneuma up through the lower mouth into the womb will pass through and percolate at the site of the sacral chakra, and so that is at the root chakra, it's I need, but in the sacral chakra is about I want, and mm. it's about creativity. It's about the things that make life juicy, um, and so and the fact that that Culpepper says oh it's abortifacient as well. That that says it it speaks to the to the sexuality too. So I'm going to say sacral chakra, but also definitely third eye. Were you dancing around the chakra that I normally associate it with? You didn't say the solar plexus chakra. I guess I kind of go with that Apollo, that radiance and shining your light. Yes, it is through the words. Yes, it is through the mind and that type of thing. But I find I, I really like it with this, working it on the solar plexus chakra as well. Makes sense. Yeah. Astrologically, where would you place it? You thought I just thought these out by now, wouldn't you? I am going to say Mercury uh, because, but also the sun, of course, because it's Apollo. But but Mercury is the only god who, well, Hermes is the only god who can go between the worlds. And that is definitely something that is like a, um, a laurel thing, how the oracle speaks to the dead and she can go to the future. So that would have to have like a, a hermetic um, part. So any more I'm out. Yeah. If I was going mainstream astrology, I'd probably say the sun as well. But there is, remember, there are hundreds of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. They're known as the asteroid belt, this whole collection. And they often carry the names of many of the other um, deities from many other different traditions. There is an um, an asteroid called Apollo. Um, it was actually very close to my son when I was born. 
And that's very much about where we shine or how we shine in the world type of thing. And so if, if that kind of interests you, Googling what is my Apollo sign, you'll probably find a little calculator and you can find a little bit about where you are best at shining and then work with Laurel to help bring that out as well. So I tend to give Laurel a little subclause as well, Beyond the Sun, and looking with the asteroid Apollo and where that is in your birth chart. That's very interesting. Thank you. I'll give you something to Google afterwards. Well, yes, that is all for this <laughs> week. Remember that our masterclass is happening next week. So you want to grab your ticket. Um, if We've talked about a lot of different oils. We've got lots to kind of cover in the masterclass as well. We can go deeper. You can ask questions about the lower mouth. And what was it? Sacred pigs we talked about oh, last week. Mystic pig. Mystic pigs. I'm rocking up the masterclass, not to share any knowledge, but just to find out about mystic pigs. So come and find out with me about mystic pigs. Of course, the link is below and the discount code is below. I know people always go, oh, yeah, I'll get around to that. This is your last chance because it's happening later this week. Anything else we need to let everyone know, Liz? No, not at all. Thank you for that. That was great today. We're going to break, I'm going to go break out my laurel because I've started, I haven't appreciated it as much as, you know, when we talk about it, I fall back in love with it like I did with Merkel last week. Until next week, we'll see you in the masterclass and we'll be back with another episode of Fellowship of Essential Oils. Take care. See you then.